Um, well, I, I thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on Alberto's um, presentation, this idea of human rights is putting a limit on what can be done in terms of enforcement. It, um, I, I think it's a really interesting idea because I know historically so much of human rights has been concerned with overreaching by the state through criminal law, and so it's very interesting to see that apply here. Um, I have a lot of questions, so let me narrow them down to, to two areas. One is I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, where or the kinds of cases or sources from which you're pulling the principles that you identify. Um, I think that they're, they're right, but it's, it strikes me that a lot of the cases of overreaching um, that, that you see um, in other areas of human rights are going to look different. So I was just wondering if you could talk about where you get those principles. And then I think specifically um, uh, whether you've thought about uh, the principle of, of proportionality or we see that also in uh, the sources that you're looking at. Um, and then the second question um, is uh, whether whether you thought about whether you found any guidance or principles about when we should be criminalizing at all, right? Uh, because it strikes me that there's really good reasons to want to provide civil uh, remedies here uh, and the ability to recover damages. But at what point, from a human rights perspective, um, does the issue become a matter for the state to intervene? And, and that sort of fundamental question, I think, um, would be really interesting to explore and see if human rights had anything to say. Um, and then I guess I'll leave it at that, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to catch up uh, in the in the at the reception. Yes. 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 Larry, and then this is a question for Ahmed. So I, I saw you getting increasingly kind of excited in your presentation. And I have to confess, I was sharing your excitement because some of the recent developments which I had not really followed in regarding the changes in language both within the draft of the Vienna Treaty and some of the statements that have been made at the national level by governments are, are quite interesting. I mean, one comment and then a question. The comment is it's not surprising that the uh, human rights language, the IP in a human rights treaty is going to be looked at very differently. It's not going to be IP tests. It's going to be framed from a very different perspective. So that, that I think, is less surprising to me. It's, we just haven't had many examples of this. I think the Refugee Convention is one small piece. But other than that, there, there isn't very much that's explicit in this way. So that was, not, that was novel, but not unexpected. What is more unexpected and, and potentially more momentous is that this language and similar sort of language is being referenced within WIPO. I think that's a big, big development. But I want to be maybe a little provocative and, and um, ask you to comment on what was reported to me as a statement that was said, and I, I can't attribute it because I can't recall who was supposed to have said it, so I'm, I'm safe in that regard, that uh, the argument with regard to the VIP treaty was, OK, fine. Uh, with regard to the development agenda, you can have one user rights treaty. We'll give you the most sympathetic one, and we'll stop there, and that's it. You'll get this and nothing more. Now, I'm not. It, maybe this is a sign that you're seeing this language there that, that maybe there's there's more of a groundswell. But that was the the fear of splitting off this issue from some of the other issues for a, a binding instrument was that everybody could get behind this, but when it came to the harder questions there wouldn't be support for moving forward. So I just would be appreciate your, your views on that. Right, and right back here. Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so in, given that the language is so exciting, I was hoping we could focus on, on some language that, that, as it flashed across the screen, the screen looked potentially problematic to me, and this was uh, where that treaty slash instrument refers to the right to take part in cultural life uh, and sharing the benefits of scientific progress. I thought I saw that sentence framed as copyright promotes the right to take part in cultural life, um, which would be a flip from the way I understand it. And, and I, I just wondered if we could go back and look at exactly what that language says. And then you alluded to something that I um, was wondering about and would love to really comment more. What are the lessons uh, that you, the folks moving this treaty slash instrument, are drawing from the failure? of the burn appendix, um, from the difficulties uh, with the compulsory licensing system and for pharmaceutical patents, in terms of the strategy of, of sort of conceding the principle and then piling it on with some of the procedural hurdles that would never be effective. I have a follow-up question for Alberta. Um, in Ash, for example, with 
widespread uh, um, use of uh, pirate software and was national outrage when the director of uh, elementary school or middle school was prosecuted. But um, in Latin America, for, for example, you give this also shocking. What are the people who was approached by police? Would they pay them not to be prosecuted? What is the practice? Uh, I want to start with that because it's easy for, for me. Uh, if you go to Chile, don't ever try to bribe the police. You can have problems with your wife and, and with your in-law, but not with the police for bribing. And I would say that in several Latin American countries, cor corruption at that level does not exist. We have corruption at other levels. Okay? So don't try to do that. You have to, to find a way, to find a way. Most of the time, unfortunately, School, um, universities, libraries, and even museums that have been treated by with criminal actions, they just need to sit at the table and try to make a deal. If they have enough power with the media, they can call the attention of the media, and then copyright holders can give up. Uh, but if you don't have power uh, for attracting the attention of the media, or you don't have the money, you could be in serious problems. Uh, most Latin American countries have migrated from inquisitorial uh, system of justice to adversarial ones, which looks kind of the U.S., but with no jury, uh, just with professional judges. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can find the same problem, the same problems and the same issues. Like if, if the proof was illegal, it will be excluded from the, the tribunal. It's, it's mostly similar. Yeah? Um, going to the first question about the human rights and his uh, relation with criminal law. It's interesting because you were complaining this morning about the, the fact that human rights seems to be to meet uh, intellectual property just recently. But curiously, that is also the complaint from criminal law scholars. There is a, a lot of scholarship, a lot of scholarship on the criminal law, uh, on interna in, sorry, in human rights and international criminal law. There is much less scholarship on human rights and domestic criminal law. Then when you go to that literature, most of that literature, most by far, is about proce procedural aspect of criminal law. The right to a fair trial, the due process of law in a criminal court. There is much less literature on substantive criminal law and human rights, and almost no literature on human rights and sentencing. That is the reason why I pushed that chapter for, for the last in my dissertation, because I need to go through. Where you can find a little bit of literature today is uh, in China, because of the process of implementing intellectual property at the same time has created some challenge on human rights. And a lot of scholars are trying to figure out who the Chinese government is going to deal with intellectual property and human rights, because China attracts attention in both issues. And more interestingly, in the UK, after the UK approved, uh, passed the, the Human Rights Act in 1998, uh, some human rights have become enforceable into domestic code, and it has created a lot of literature on the field in the UK. There is not that much literature in, in Latin America, unfortunately. Uh, but what is interesting is that most of the principles of criminal, classical principles of criminal law, uh, you can find them in international human instruments on human rights. The principle of legality, the presumption of innocence, the one that is kind of complicated is the uh, principle of proportionality. The only international instrument that on human rights that expressly uh, refer to it is the Charter, the European Union Charter on Human Rights, which is a recent document from 2000. Uh, no other instrument have an explicit reception of the principle of proportionality, but you can pull around. Uh, you can find also some constitutions that refer to the principle of proportionality. That is the case, for example, of Mexico, and probably that is one of the reasons why you see a more rational approach on criminalizing copyright infringement in Mexico. Uh, but not all the countries have that principle. How do I strike the principle of proportionality? Basically because, uh, because human rights instruments may not refer to the principle of proportionality directly on criminal law issues. But they do refer to some requirements for setting limitations to human rights. Criminal law is by definition a limitation to human rights. Every single time that I punish someone, I'm depriving that person from his right to life. When I set a fine, I'm depriving that person from his right to property. 
And therefore, human rights set actual limitations on criminal law on proportionality, because criminal law has to satisfy the exigencies, the requirements for limitations on human rights instruments. And that is the way you can boil proportionality. There are other scholars we can talk later that have extracted the principle of proportionality from a set of uh, uh, provisions on the European uh, Convention on Human Rights. Uh, we can talk about that maybe. Thank you, for, for, uh, thank you Larry, for, for uh, your, 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 your question. Um, no, I, well, I think that is, I mean, well, first on, on the language, on the novelty, and yeah. Um, <clears throat> It is, it is still for me, I mean, maybe because I come more from the IP background and the human rights background, it is for me more novel but, <laughs> and unexpected, so both. But, but notice that when we go to the, to the VIP treaty, it, we should have expected normally to take the wording and the Convention on Human Rights Disabilities, that, that is in this, but it's not, right? It is, the, it is a much more general wording and this formulation of a barrier does not explicitly appear there, and that, that's very interesting. Now, this, this question of will it be uh, uh, just one shot at this, etc., that's the million dollar question, and that is something that uh, has been in the minds of many people since this issue was brought to the table and, and, and tabled, and the treaty was tabled in 2009. Now, concretely, actually, uh, what happened at the time in 2009, uh, when, 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 uh, when Brazil and a number of countries tabled the World War II Treaty, then the African group, because of this concern that you mentioned, tabled another proposal for a treaty that had the three issues. The first that was not limited to visually impaired, that was for disabled per persons in general. That also included li libraries, education, and, and research. And I think uh, 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 that was uh, 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 an interesting development. And, and, and they then came with, with a view that they, were, that they would be very keen to see a package and to see all issues addressed. So what happened is that a kind of a, s a sequence was created that you would first address the VIP uh, uh, issue, but then that there was a kind of a commitment to a work program where you would also discuss libraries and educational research. So, so, so in, the, in, in the future meetings of, of, of the Standard Committee, you have already uh, 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 days that are allocated to libraries and education. But how do you address them? Will it be to treaties? It, it, I mean, or will you have to, uh, the other issue that people, is that not only will you have to, will you address libraries and others, but will you have to pay for this VIP treaty with a treaty on broadcasting, right? That many people have been, with. open question, I have my own, I mean, everybody probably, I mean, I, mean, I have, have my own thoughts uh, uh, on that, but I think that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a key, uh, it's a key challenge, and, uh, but it would be very interesting to see what, what happens uh, on that. Uh, <clears throat> But I would fully agree about, and just, uh, just to point something that, that Steve mentioned, the issue of rhetoric in IP. And there's an issue that, that having followed a bit, the, it's fascinating, and I, would, I, I, would, uh, I think it would be great for academics or for research projects on the rhetoric on IP multilaterally. Right? And, and it, because people who are working on, on the multilateral text are extremely attentive at the rhetoric and the language used. And, 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 and in different forms, and, and it would be a great project to have a kind of a of using literature interpretation and all that to, to look at the rhetoric of IP and how it has uh, evolved. And that makes the transition to Leah's question on, on, on the wording of, of that we have. Uh, right, and you're, you're totally right. And, and I, saw, I, I didn't skip me in the beginning, I, I was looking for the sharing for our scientific. Right, and, and that is interesting that you have this, this, this formulation uh, 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 here that puts copyright as a means of, 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 um, of, of participating in culture and life and enjoying that. But I'm not surprised to see it again, uh, because that is the view of the copyright system. Uh, and, and we had this discussion, exactly the same discussion, in what I mentioned 2003 in the World Summit on Information Society, right? Uh, where, 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 where we had two texts of copyright as an enabler or copyright as a barrier. And the compromise uh, was in that text that uh, is Article 38 of the World Summit Declaration that says that diffusion of information is important in the, the information society. and intellectual property contributes to that, but it doesn't separate them, it didn't equate them, right? So here we go back to this original equation. So I, I, I think it's interesting, you're right, that this is a bit, uh, it's, it, 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 it changes a bit the, 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 the approach that, that, is, um, that, is, that there was on, on, on this issue, actually, in the separation that you had in the Universal Declaration.
So we're running out of time. I wanted to, um, to ask a question, following on, on Larry's question, and then ask the question for Stephen, which I think sort of build on each other. Um, so I'm curious about the political economy that led to this. You know, whether it is an exception, as Larry, is this an exception? This is very, it was a very easy thing to pass, or can we draw any generalizable um, conclusions and uh, from from this, you know, this, this language coming together? And in particular. Do you think that there's sort of like a new community of practice where human rights and intellectual property experts are coming together? So you talked about how the two worlds were just two different communities of people. So is there an emergent um, community um, of practice where you actually have intellectual property scholars talking to human um, rights scholars? And then um, the other question for Stephen is in terms of in, um, inclusion and empowerment. How, I mean, how, which way does that um, cut? Like, how does that come out if you're thinking about um, applying stuff to local s situations? Would that really do it in an industry specific way? So, would, would some industries require less copyright protection than others? You're know, talking about local, um, and what does that mean about potential um, participation? So is it, are, you, are, you, are you envisioning something in which you have different regimes according to different industries or just according to different geographies, right? Is it subject specific or geography specific? Um, since I haven't answered your question yet, I'll go first. Right. Um, yes, um, and it's, it's really almost that simple. Um, the idea that you look at it is a problem-solving approach. I think that we have a real problem with treating um, software and literary works and movies and everything else as identical. In this country and in every other country, and, and using copyright uh, regime in, in too vanilla way across too many platforms. Um, in the United States, we've done things with like um, mass works, we cut those out. And with uh, live performances, we cut that out. And with um, boat hulls, we cut that out and made special sui generis um, um, Program. So I think that that's very important to think about, but also very country by country as to what the problem is. You may not want to copyright or patent, you may not want to patent software at all, you may not want to patent uh, business methods, uh, or you might. Uh, you may want, not want to copyright software at all, you might want to have a sui generis regime in any particular country, but also in a particular country, you may not want a derivative works right at all. Or you may want to limit it dramatically more than what we have here. So you've got to look at what is the copyright problem there. I think that if you just eliminate l um, literal copying, you know, literal copying and distribution, that solves almost all of the piracy problems, almost all of the copyright problems. And so then you just you don't even really have to worry about that sort of work. So so yeah, I would say that it, it is it does go. We should be looking at on an industry-wide basis, uh, or different industries are different. We should be looking at geographically, what is going on in that actual country? What is the nature of the problem actually there? Are they just taking software? That's a different problem than if they're taking movies. Are they just taking movies and software? That's different than if they're copying a bunch of books. So I think that you have these different things to look at. Um, as far as, um, yeah, I think that there is a very small number of people of, who started to talk about this. I don't know if there's any people in practice who are, but certainly academics have started for some time now, but it's growing, to talk about IP and human rights. Um, in fact, there's been some who say, well, right, IP right is, is a human right. right, and I think that there are those yeah. who say, hell no, IP isn't a human right, that's the worst possible step to take. Uh, and there are others who say, well, you know, actually we can live together, why can't we all just go, and we can, and, and with, with our institute, that's sort of the way that we take the view is that is that this uh, inclusion and empowerment thing is a way to think about it. it it's, it's not just, we, I actually believe that copyright can create works, can help incentivize creating works and promote the creation and dissemination of works. Um, it's simply that it can also really stifle it, and it can also be working very much heavily for those who already have the power and against those who don't. So it's a question of what should it look like to reach the balance you want. Great. I think we're gonna we're gonna end here because we've run out of time. But thank you everyone for coming and thank you for the little post and